Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for another Thirsty Thursday here at the Maryland Distillers Guild uh, Facebook page, where you have a wonderful guest this afternoon. I'll be speaking with Braden Bumpers from McClintock Distilling in Frederick, Maryland. Uh, just so everybody out there who's viewing is uh, up with the, the current information, Maryland's distilleries are able to still sell you product in this weird time. Please find your way to your favorite local distillery and pick up your favorite bottles of spirits and um, just show your support for these great local businesses. We've had a couple of great businesses on already who have shared their stories with you. Today we're going to hear all about McClintock Distilling and what they're doing and I think you guys are going to have a lot of fun. So without further ado, I'm going to kick this over to Braden. Braden, thanks for joining us. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. So uh, let's jump right into it, man. It's a rainy day here in Frederick. Why don't you tell us all about what's going on at McClintock, what you guys have been up to, where you came from, and uh, then we'll get into some spirits. Awesome. Uh, yeah, so so like Jim said, my name is Braven. Uh, I'm one of the uh, co-founders and head distillers here at McClintock Distilling. Uh, we are just about to uh, celebrate our, I guess, three and a half years being open to the public here in downtown Frederick. Uh, we are the first and only organic certified distillery in the state of Maryland. Uh, and our focus here is just using really high quality, uh, non-genetically modified natural ingredients. Uh, we focus on whiskeys and gins, but we also have a great vodka and uh, some all natural cordials, one of which we'll be playing around with today. That's awesome. So, uh, What's your background? What got you guys into distilling? You and Tyler, your uh, co-founder, what got you guys into distilling and kind of what inspired opening McClintock and what, what brought you to Maryland? Oh, that's a great question. So uh, me and Tyler, um, we have been in the alcohol industry and I, I think between the two of us, almost two decades now. Um, we, we started out uh, as on the brewing side of things, uh, although we've uh, we were both apprenticing at a fairly large distillery before uh, the laws started to change in Maryland to allow smaller distilleries to open up here. Um, we're both from Maryland. We're born and raised here. Um, and we thought it would just be a really great opportunity to come back home and restore a lot of the heritage and history of distilling in Maryland, particularly when it comes to uh, whiskeys um, and gins. So that's um, part of the reason we wanted to go through the organic certification is we want to use these heirloom, traditional Maryland grown grains to really recapture what it was that made our distilling industry so special, you know, pre-prohibition and in Maryland's heyday when uh, the, the distilleries really dominated here. And since opening uh, three and a half years ago, how's the reception been? You guys are kind of like, town you're, you're like favorites among the people that come in there all the time i hear people who talk about coming in and i had the same conversation with monica when she was on um you know downtown has really embraced this idea of the craft culture and i think you guys fit right in uh yeah you, you you getting the same sense i i think downtown frederick is a really special place um where you know people really do if you walk down the downtown area you're not seeing a lot of corporate owned restaurants and bars. That's all every single shop. It's independently owned. The owner is in the shop. You know, they're talking to people passionate about what they do. I think we fit into that uh, very much. And, you know, the people here are just, it's, it's incredible to see, you know, we, we had no idea, you know, how the distillery would have grown the way it has. And, um, you know, particularly with the spirit as divisive as gin, which is, you know, not the most popular uh, spirit in, in America. Uh, we've really seen people embrace it and try new products, new flavor profiles in a way that's really, you know, exciting and, and special. I've had the opportunity to attend a couple of your uh, Inventors Club group events. And I have to say that I have always been impressed by the way that you kind of showcase experimentation to your clientele like you want people to see that you are an evolving brand like you're not going to be stayed with uh an idea or with this preconception of what 
McClintock is. You guys are very forward thinking as a company. Your whole team seems very engaged and uh, invigorated when it comes up with something to do with a, a new use or a new product. Is that something that you guys have instilled in your staff or is that something that your team just brings naturally? I, I think we're really lucky, especially during this time. I've been so impressed with every single one of our staff members. You know, I think people who want to work here just seem to have been, we, we seem to tend to draw people who are passionate and excited about this industry and what we do here. And one of the um, founding missions we had when we started here was we wanted to be transparent about what we do here. And we want to be, um, you know, never staying static with what we're doing here. So we're always tweaking stuff. We're always trying to improve what we're doing. Um, I, I always believe that if a, if a, a product isn't being innovated, then it's dead in the water. So we really are always trying to um, embrace what is, you know, coming down the pipeline, trying new things that have never been done before. And I think um, people have been excited to try, you know, our successes as well as some of our failures, you know, which is, which is always uh, fun. And, um, you know, it's spirits in particular, it's just so constantly evolving. You know, you, you tell you the peanut butter whiskey that's on the shelf now, and there's, you know, Fireball last year, there's so many weird products out there that, you know, we, we really want to you know, match the big brands with the innovation and the creativity we can bring um, just using natural and high quality ingredients instead of uh, other, other. Well, speaking of innovation, uh, one of your innovation series collaborators is in our chat right now. Chris Sands wants to give everybody a shout out and let them know that there was a hop infused whiskey that may have been very good. Yeah, I I, uh, I think that the innovation series we we um, we hit a point where we had three different gins, three different whiskeys. We were gonna have two vodkas in our core portfolio, and we had to kind of make a decision where we keep our core portfolio, but we're always you know pushing these really fun experimental and collaborative products. So last year we launched our innovation series, which is one of my favorite parts of this distillery. Um, we started with a uh, a Dutch style Geneva that we collaborated with the Baltimore Spirits Company. We swapped whiskey mashes and then made our own interpretation of it. That was a lot of fun uh, for anybody that never has had a Geneva. There, it's a really wild spirit. One of my one of my favorites. Um, and then we did a collaboration with Chris Sands of the Unpacked Podcast, where we did a chocolate malted barley whiskey, and then as we were distilling it. We infuse it with two different hops um, that we were helped out with from uh, Monocacy Brewing here in town. Uh, and then our last one was a, a straight wheat whiskey uh, that we distilled here and then aged in um, apple brandy barrels from 10th Ward, another distillery right up the street here. Um, and that's, I guess, a segue to one of my favorite things about being home here in Maryland after working in this industry in other states is we have... I think one of the most collaborative uh, environments in this industry that I've seen anywhere in the country. And it's awesome that we get to work with great people every day from the brewers to the winemakers to the distillers all around the state. It's encouraging to hear you say that. Last week when we had Scott Sanders from Tobacco Barn Distillery on, he kind of echoed the exact same sentiment. Uh, he mm -hmm. brought up several times that there were some points in developing either their business plan or coming up with how they would deal with expansion or uh, approaching new products where reaching out to other members of the guild, other businesses that were operating as distilleries in the state really benefited them. And they never felt like there was this uh, competitive one-upsmanship. Nobody was going to say, Hey, Scott's trying to do this with his team. We need to, we need to head him off or anything like that. He really, made it sound as though he felt like with open arms, people were willing to help lift everybody up. Uh, yeah. And to that collaborative note, I wanted to say hi to Taka from uh, American Shochu, who is also in the Maryland Distillers Guild. He also operates in Frederick and is also in the chat room saying hello to us. Hi, Taka. So these collaborative ideas, I, I really like hearing about them, especially these ones where you are you say you swapped a whiskey mash with Baltimore Spirits Company and that's how you ended up? So you took each other's mash and then fermented that out and then distilled from there? 
Yeah, it was one of my favorite projects we've done because you know, we'll, we'll talk plenty about gin in a little bit, but one of my favorite parts of gin is you basically start with a blank canvas and flavor profile. You, you have to use some juniper in there, but you can really make it taste like whatever you want. And that's what really like made me fall in love with gin is you can get, you know, I always tell people, it's not that you don't like gin, it's that you haven't found the right gin for you yet. So you can get chili pepper gins to cherry blossom gins to, uh, you know, pretty much anything you could think of, coffee gins. And um, it's really fun. You can experiment with these different botanicals and make pretty much any flavor profile you, you, you want. And what was fun with the Geneva project was that we were, rather than using a neutral base where it's not imparting a ton of flavor, we were able to distill it a little bit lower, recapture, in our case, like the flavor profile of the Epic Rye Whiskey. And they were able to utilize the flavor of our Bootjack Rye Whiskey and kind of build the flavor profile around that. So rather than you know trying to overpower it with you know floral notes or whatever, we kind of made it a little bit more savory, a little more spice for it because theirs is so robust and peppery already. We wanted to build off that, and it was really fun, you know, tweaking a bunch of different recipes to get something that we, we ended up really liking. And um, from from what I heard from Max and Eli at Baltimore Spirits, is they uh, you know had had the, the same same uh, fun on their side of things as well. I don't mean to be a, a stickler or anything, but I have a question that popped up because of the thought there. So are 100% of your products that are released released with the USDA organic stamp, or do you have to vary that based on what your ingredient bill is? That is a, a another great question. So not all 100% of our products are USDA certified. All of our products are made from 100% USDA organic ingredients. So uh, for instance, like our forager gin, this is a certified product. This is certified by the USDA. But when we get to something like our reserve gin, because this is aged for a year and a half and used cognac barrels, that's not a, like a clean container. It is imparting flavor and character from that cognac um, that was in the barrel beforehand. And because there is a, you know, contamination, which is a purposeful contamination that we're looking for, then is no longer uh, certified organic, just made from 100% organic materials. So that's a great, great question. And that's why you'll see the seal on most of our products, but not all of the products. So, and just a follow-up when you were when you were doing this great Genevieve project was so you're saying the Baltimore Spirits Company is probably also using organically sourced mash and stuff like that is it common so, yeah so they were using um I know they do use some organic certified stuff the innovation series products uh, most of those are not organic certified because we're usually collaborating with other people who can't either verify or are not using 100% organic. That makes sense. Okay. So all of our core products are 100% organic certified. The innovation series, you know, because we are collaborating with a lot of different people, most of those do not qualify for organic certification. And it sounds like that gives you room to maybe use ingredients that wouldn't traditionally fall into the organic certification anyway. Yeah. Yeah. And that's really like the only drawback from with the organic certification is I like it because it's just an easy way to ensure that the products we're getting in are really high quality. They're grown without pesticides, fungicides, or other chemicals. It's always 100% non-genetically modified, but there are some ingredients you just can't get in an organic certified manner. So doing these collaborations and these projects under the innovation series, we can do, uh, we can use a lot of these ingredients and processes that, that aren't right now at least, you know, certifiable through the USDA. Um, so it's kind of a, it lets us spread our creative wings a little bit. There's nothing like building in your own limitations, man. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because we were the first, uh, we were certified by the Maryland Department of Agriculture and we were the first uh, alcohol producer they had certified. There was a lot of uh, kind of working with them to set up these guidelines and exactly what it means to be a certified organic alcohol producer in the state. And I think we, we came to a good 
uh, you know, happy medium where it is not uh, impossible to obtain. So we want other producers to go through this process, but it's also not, you know, meaningless either. You really do have to put in the work and get, get make sure you're quality controlling all of your sources to be able to get that. In a past life, a long, long time ago, I worked for Whole Foods and uh, there was a very big commitment to understanding what really organic meant and how to handle products that were given that certification so that you didn't you didn't give the consumer any reason to ever doubt what kind of weight that certification really carried and you know there are people that have their thoughts on the health impact and nutrition of conventional foods versus organic foods but to in ensure that that label has some standing or meaning it's very important that uh, the producers who carry those certifications and the people who are handling it really know what's going on so it's great Absolutely. to hear that. Um, so when you and I first met, we bonded over a conversation about gin. I remember uh, being in a local retailer talking about uh, gins that were going to be on sale for a dollar over cost. And you pointed me <laughs> to a German gin and said, you got to go with this, uh, Monkey 47. <laughs> yeah. And uh, since then, every time I talk to you, gin seems to come up. So I'm excited to get around to the gins that you're going to show today. Uh, and kind of hear what your philosophy is. But what does your tasting lineup look like today that you want to share with everybody? Yeah, uh, so I can run through kind of origins that we have in stock here. And uh, just before we get into that, kind of go into why I personally fell in love with gin uh, a, a few years ago. And that it is gin really is from a production standpoint and as a consumer, I think one of the most creative spirits that there is on the market today. I think there's so much room for innovation, for creativity, for really pushing the envelope because of what gin is. So if you're looking at something like whiskey, you know, whiskey by definition has to be made from 100% grains. And then when you go beyond that, it, a bourbon needs to be at least 51% corn. And then the rest has to be 100% grains as we distill that a certain proof has to be aged in, in uh, you know, white American charred oak for a certain number of years. There's so many for most spirit categories. These are really, really tight definitions. And, you know, that's what's cool about whiskey is like, you know, you can see these producers create vastly different products using the same ingredients, but it's much more about subtlety and depth and complexity. Whereas gin, you know, any, any new person's spirits, you can try my gin and then try another gin and you can tell the difference right away because their definition of gin is it needs to have the flavor or character of juniper to be qualified as a gin. So I can make a gin for two juniper berries in there, say this, this has some character and flavor of juniper in there and you can really taste like anything, which is you know really neat. And if you look at the trends almost everywhere else in the world, gin is the most popular spirit in, in the world. Like every single continent, except for the uh, North America, gin is the most consumed spirit out there. And it's cool to see, you know, if, if you look at some of these other countries and what's happening here in the US now, is you see this emerging category of so many cool different types of gins that are out there. And it's really, uh, kind of captured my attention really early on and now seeing how it has evolved is a really, it's a beautiful spirit category, which we, we love. So, gin, gins and whiskeys are really what we're passionate about here. And it's, it's uh, one of my favorites. I don't think I realized that gin was so popular globally. I, I understand, yeah. you know, parts of maybe what, what would have been considered the Eastern expansion of the, the British Empire and things like that, bringing gin that way, and I guess from more from continental Europe and then to the UK and then over. But yeah, uh, it's it's incredible. I think uh, I'd, I'd have to double check the numbers, but I think in the UK it was something like sixty eight percent of all spirits drink last year was gin. So you know, usually when you think there, you think of Scotch whiskey, you know, Irish whiskey, gin dominates um like your europe gin is the most consumed spirit by probably double that's fascinating i uh mm -hmm. i've been a fan of gin for a long time and it was just recently that we were watching actually like top gear or grand tour one of those ones with jeremy clarkson driving around the world in a crazy car 
and uh, he saddles up to the bar, orders a gin and tonic, and they brought it in a goblet. And I'm like, this is not right. What's going on here? And then I started looking, and sure enough, like that was the traditional way to start serving gin and tonics to people because it can serve temperature so much better than a, a rocks glass or a shaker. Yes, yes. it is. It's fascinating. We do, uh, we do a gin class, and the, the ways gin has impacted history, human history, is incredible it's you know um the term fruit from these from from what you'd see on any bottle of spirit that comes from gin when the british sailors were allocated gin as part of their stipend to be in the british royal navy they uh they would basically allocate up several barrels per ship and then it was up to the admiral and captain to distribute it amongst the people and a lot of the admirals and captains would siphon off, you know, a good bit of it and then either sell it or keep it for themselves, water it down and then give it to their, their folks. And these guys were smart. They figured out if you take that gin, which traditional Navy strength gin is usually 57% ABV or higher, and you poured it on gunpowder, if it was at proof, it would light. But if it was lower than that, it would not light the gunpowder. So if it wouldn't light, that was proof that you were being gypped out of your, your extra alcohol. And that's where that term comes from. Uh, same with like prohibition, there's a ton of, of gin correlation to it there. The gin and tonic uh, is directly from, from um, a lot of the British imperialist times and they're occupying uh, different areas. So it's, it's really fascinating to see, you know, how much gin has played a part in, in human history. Yeah, the gin and tonic carries some anti-malarial capability, doesn't it? That's right, it's, it's, it's a cure, it's health. Help, healthy for you and you get limes so you don't need to mess with scurvy so you're all set yeah, exactly you get all your bases are covered there that's awesome a gin, a gin and tonic a day keeps the doctor away that's that's what i believe there you go so do you have that <laughs> at breakfast and then an apple later or do we just uh skip yeah, you're, you're, yeah so how many gins do you guys produce in your portfolio normally so we have three gins that are part of our core portfolio um, the first one that we have here is the cocktail we'll be making today. This is our Forager Gin. Uh, this is the most popular spirit we make. It's probably what we're best known for. Um, we opened this. This was a recipe Tyler and I have been working on for several years before the distillery had started. And the idea behind this one is we wanted to incorporate um, like, like how a winery would use terroir to like define and characterize the wine that they're making. We wanted to do that, but with a gin and particularly for what we have here in Frederick. So the forager is a combination of two recipes, one of just a general gin recipe we've been working on for a long time. And when we came back from here to Frederick, we wanted to incorporate a lot of native Appalachian botanicals. So we have nine different traditional Appalachian grown botanicals in this that gives it this really like wild, woodsy, herbaceous flavor. And a lot of these ingredients, we, we picked them out of a whole box fire book. These have been used for people living up in the mountains for you know decades for medicinal uses, for cooking, for all of these different things. Um, but they really hadn't been used in alcohol before we, we started playing around with them. So it is a very unique taste. They're really like, it's, people always ask me to compare my gins to other gins. This one is probably the hardest because it's such a unique, such a very, uh, you know, Appalachian centered product that it's, um, it's really just, I always tell people, like, you should just try a little bit of it because it's, it's really, really neat. Um, this is the one we'll be doing the cocktail with today because we built this to work um, as a sipping gin that also can pivot and be great as a cocktail mixer as well. So any gin we make, we always test it out in a gin and tonic, a martini, and a Negroni, the three most popular cocktails we find in the U.S., and make sure that it works with at least one or two of them um, so we can recommend it because it, you know, gin is a very cocktail-centered spirit. Um, although we're trying to popularize the idea of a sipping style gin you enjoy like whisk, uh, it, we're, we're hoping in the next few years. So that's a forager here. Um, our, other gin, uh, our other gin that was a seasonal product that is now available uh, year-round is our Gardner's Gin. Um, this is one of our 
one of our more popular products. Uh, it started as a summer seasonal, so it's very light. It's very aromatic. It's really built for these nice, nice, light, like outdoor drinking um, kind of gin. It's made with a focus on lavender, cucumber, and mint. We finish it with three different citrus peels, and then we light age it in Madeira wine barrels to give it without too much heavy red wine flavors. We just wanted to give it a little bit of that body to give it some depth when you're drinking it. Um, and this one is great. I like it just this a little bit of club soda and a, a lemon wedge. And it's my, was my go-to porch drink of last summer and probably will be this summer as well. Um, and uh, it's, like I said, we finally now got a reliable supplier of Madeira wine barrels from the islands off the coast of Portugal. And um, so now we can make this product all, all the time here with us. We're very excited about it. And then the last of our core gins that's my personal favorite, is the reserve gin. Um, this is one that's an exception to the rule I mentioned earlier in that we built this specifically to be a sipping style of gin. So this is a little bit higher proof. It's going to drink closer to a barrel strength whiskey than a traditional gin. Um, it's a little bit more subdued in terms of the botanicals that we added to it, but a lot of the complexity actually comes from the barrel aging process. And this one we age in exo cognac barrels we import directly from France. It gets aged for a little over a year in those barrels. So a lot of the flavor profile in this one actually comes from the cognac content. So it's got this like deep kind of fruit body to it, that really rich kind of classic cognac uh, essence. And then we built the botanical profile to complement that base. So we have some sweet Valencia orange peel, there's cinnamon, some fennel. It's just a very rich, very, uh, very uh, stout gin that kind of stands on its own. And I used to be a purist about this, is that this gin should only be drinking on its own. Uh, but some of the bars we've seen, uh, particularly here in Frederick and Baltimore, DC, uh, have made some really, really good cocktails that we have on our website. Um, they actually tend to be more like whiskey cocktails. So like it works great in a old fashioned. It works great in a Manhattan. Um, less so, you know, you can use it in a gin tonic, but you kind of lose what makes it special. Um, this is my, my first favorite. And then uh, I do have the collaborative Geneva gin. So this is our innovation series number one. Uh, we're down to the last few bottles of this, but we do still have some in stock. And this is, um, uh, this is our botanical mix with the Baltimore Spirits Company Epic Straight Rye Whiskey Mash um, that we distill low. It has a rich, very rye forward flavor base. And then we complement it with more of a traditional savory Dutch botanical blend. Uh, so a lot of uh, fennel, there's a good amount of juniper in there. It's a really nice, um, just kind of wild spirit if you're ever looking for Geneva. I was going to mention that you and I had the uh, ability to work on a collaborative beer and spirits dinner uh, a couple of years back, and it was right when you were about to release that reserve gin. And I just remember how remarkable that was to approach the barrel aged gin experiences I'd had prior to that were not all exceptional. Um, and I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that because I've had experiences where most people expect a nice botanical experience with a gin. You want to be able to explore the different savory, spicy, citrusy notes that may be present there. Uh, and in the past, I've had experiences where all I got was vanilla from like an uncharred barrel or something like that. And, and just a really unpleasant attribution to what barrel aged gin was so when you poured that gin for me and i tasted that i was just i was floored that you could make something like that without really being offensive and mm -hmm. uh i i am glad that you brought that up as the sipping gin because as soon as you said your goal was to make a sipping gin here i'm thinking i think you may have already done that <laughs> well it's definitely i i think it, it absolutely is and that's one thing that is very cool about gin right now is that barrel aged gins are very new. You know, there is there is like 
a few that have been around for a really long time, but kind of this rise of Vero eight pins is just starting to become popular within the last few years. Right? There's only a handful of them out there, and it is it's really neat to be part of a brand new you know style of product that's entering the market. And it is um, you know we went a different way. I've had some. Uh, you know, a lot of gins are aged in use whiskey barrels, and that charcoal can be a little overwhelming. But I've had some gins that are balanced very well. So it, it's just a very different process to take a gin that the flavor profile is still going to be changed significantly after you make it. So it's really, you know, we, we did a class on for new distillers on how to make a barrel aged gin. And it's really important to consider how long you're going to age it for, what type of barrels you're going to age it for, um, you know, kind of work backwards rather than starting with a gin and then saying, oh, I want to take this gin and throw it in a barrel and see what, how, what it does. We recommend the sellers start from the barrel and then work your way back from there and build around the flavors you're going to end up with. Um, and it's, you know, I, I, I have not tried to barrel age gin uh, in different styles of barrels that I, I didn't like. You know, sometimes it is very you know oaky and very forward uh, and sometimes it can be really light like our gardener's gin just like that hint of barrel presence in there and it's um it's it's awesome and that's that's what's great about the craft community as a whole in the u.s it's really you know rapidly changing it's great and it sounds like there's a lot to be learned from your colleagues across the country um everybody's trying something new and you're getting the opportunity to kind of see what works and what doesn't and how you can apply those those new traits. And I think that's that's really cool. Uh, comment from another team member from the Maryland Distillers Guild. Abby is very happy that we're talking about the Forager Gym. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely what people best know it's for. It's a really, really fun ride. I, I am fortunate to have always kind of had a... a not a preference, but a, an appreciation for gin. My parents were gin drinkers when I was growing up and I was always curious about it. And I may or may not have tried it before I was of legal drinking age. <laughs> um, but I've met a lot of people who, and I think you kind of touched on it earlier, that gin can be polarizing, who have tasted gin and think, you know, why do I want to drink something that tastes like pine salt or Christmas trees or all this? And I think it's great that you have this variety in your lineup because you're really kind of showcasing there's a lot more to it than just juniper and just the approach to that one particular um ingredient absolutely and i think that's kind of where gin got kind of a bad rap for it is you know for a long time really the only gins that were out there were just different variations of the london dry style gin which is very juniper forward and i love a good london dry you know if i'm getting a martini i'll use it Order of London dry gin, so you get that really potent juniper forward note. But you know, if you don't like that, a lot of people will try that and be like, "Well, that's what all gins taste like." I don't want that. But gins can have balance and complexity, and you know, a depth that a lot of people aren't familiar with. And so we're three three years in of, of hard selling people to please try gin, even if you don't like gin. Try this gin; it's very different than what you normally expect from from a London dry. Um, and it's, you know, we're starting to see a little bit of movement uh, every year. Gin becomes a little bit more popular. It's starting to grow a little bit faster. So I think um, uh, in general attitudes about gin are starting to change, which is wonderful. We love to see that. Watching the expression on a consumer's face as they have that aha moment is always a beautiful thing, too. Like, oh, my gosh, I've, you know, I'm sure you've heard it a million times. I've never had a gin like this or I've never had a gin that I liked, you know. <laughs> Uh, coming from the beer world, I've heard that about just about every style of beer that I've presented to somebody. So it's always refreshing that you can kind of reawaken somebody's idea of what they think that they liked or um, give them an opportunity to try something in a new light. Yeah, absolutely. So the or you said you had a few bottles left of the uh, collaboration gin there, um, but the other gins are in fairly good stock and good inventory. Those are things that you're offering regularly now? Yep. So all three of our origins we have year round. Um, they're always available from the distillery. Um, we are rolling out our delivery and curbside service. We do free delivery within 30 miles of Frederick. Um, 
So you can order uh, all four of these gins. Um, and if you're outside the delivery zone, our forager gin is pretty well distributed throughout Maryland, Delaware, and DC. You can find that there's probably a liquor store close to your house at Forager. Um, and if you're interested in the gardeners of the reserve, just ask the local liquor store. It's available, it's pretty easy to pick up and they can, they can uh, get that for you. Um, the innovation series, little little harder to find out there in the market. If you want one of these, just let us know and we'll, we'll make sure you get it. Sounds very accommodating. <laughs> we try. <laughs> so uh, you mentioned a little bit earlier that you kind of have this this uh, passion for both gin and whiskey. What do you guys have for whiskey products and uh, what what does that look like for the consumer? Yes, let me grab my whiskeys out here. We can take a look at those. So I have three whiskeys, part of our core whiskeys. Grab one more. So um, whiskey, when we started our whiskey program, our focus here was on the quality of the raw materials. So we get most of these grains are grown locally. Um, every single grain in all of our whiskeys are non-genetically modified grown without chemicals. And one thing that we love here, and I try to tell everybody it makes a world of difference, is we are one of the handful of distilleries left in the entire world that is still using 100% stone ground flour. So we have a stone burr mill on site. We mill our own grains into flour, so we can quality control every ounce of grain as it comes in. We process it ourselves, and we can, uh, by using stone, you keep the temperature a lot lower than you do with like a modern day hammer mill. There's a lot more friction there. So the flavors you get out on the other end, you're not burning off a lot of these like lighter progenaries that give you flavor in your finished product. Um, so we really, uh, you know, put a big focus on our whiskey program on the preparation and the fermentation of the raw materials. I know it's not the most sexy part of making whiskey, but we, you know, we love to nerd out with people about greens and, and heirloom bridles and playing around with a lot of stuff there. So we do have uh, two innovation whiskeys which we are uh, sold out of now. So uh, we talked about the wheat whiskey and the um, single malt whiskey we did with Uncap and Tenford. These are our core whiskeys. Uh, the white whiskey is available year round. This one is was our first whiskey we brought to market. Um, this is a traditional Maryland style high rye whiskey that we distill a little bit extra clean. It is distilled to be a steel aged whiskey. So um, the mash bill is the same on our white whiskey and our boot jack. The biggest difference is the way we distill it. This is made to be enjoyed as a white spirit. So sometimes I, I get the same thing with gin, with the white whiskey, people are a little scared to try it sometime. I just tell them this is not moonshine. You know, this isn't grain alcohol. This is distilled specifically to be enjoyed as a white rye whiskey. And it's a very cool product because there are, um, most of the white whiskeys you probably find on the market are usually corn based. Um, so with the rye, you get this really nice, just like kind of light, almost like cardamom spice to it on the front end. And then the finish, we finish ours with wheat and corn. So you get this really nice kind of almost like um, uh, a fruit note on the back end. And then it's just a nice, smooth, drinking whiskey. This is light. It's easy. Um, we get a lot of people who are just starting to get into whiskey. And this is a really good entry whiskey to, to, to get behind. Um, then our boot jack was our next release. Uh, we have this in stock now. We This year should have it most of the year in stock. It is the same mash bill, traditional Maryland high rye, 75% Brutzi rye, 20% red fife wheat, and 5% yellow pink corn. Um, this one is distilled to go into the barrel and then is aged um, on site in 30 gallon white new cooperage American oak barrels. Uh, between 18 months to two and a half years. Usually we try to blend um, between four to eight barrels for every batch that we do to ensure consistency. Um, so it's somewhere in that age range there. Um, this one uh, is, you know, when people talk about kind of the heyday of Maryland rye whiskey, I try to point them in this direction because it's heirloom grains that were traditionally used 
It's a mash bill that we recreated from a local distillery in Burkittsville in Frederick County here that was very big pre-prohibition, um, aged more traditional long-term aging here. Um, in our special you know, microclimate we have here in Maryland, um, it's 90 proof. It has a ton of character, a ton of flavor, um, but a nice clean finish. It's not quite as um, peppery as a lot of people might associate with Maryland uh, with uh, high rye whiskeys. It does have some of that light pepperiness to it, but I think you get a little bit more vanilla, caramel, and cherry on this product. Um, it's probably my favorite of, of the, uh, the rye whiskeys, or of the whiskeys we make here. And then last but not least uh, is our matchstick straight bourbon. Um, this is our most popular whiskey that we make. Uh, it is a uh, low corn, weeded rye finished bourbon. So it is 51% corn. It's a mix of yellow, yellow king and gem glass corn. It is 30% uh, red flake wheat. And then we actually put a 19% rye finish on this from a, a Brutzi and Danko rye. So this one, uh, we kind of wanted to do a Maryland twist on a, on a, a kind of classic bourbon. And then this one gets aged between two to three years before we release it. So a lot of maturity, definitely a, a little bit higher presence of oak in there. Um, also the 30 gallon barrel, so you get a, a nice uh, nice wood presence to this one. Also 90 proof, also very smooth. Um, and this was the one uh, that won uh, double gold at the World Spirits competition uh, last year, uh, which was the uh, highest rated bourbon ever made in the state of Maryland. Well, congratulations on that. That's a that's a heck of an accomplishment. Yeah. Uh, so I find it intriguing, and I, I, if I'm off base with my assumption here, please correct me. But I find it very neat that three and a half years in, white whiskey is still something that you've kept in your portfolio. When the craft uh, spirits, yeah. when the craft spirits movement kind of started, I heard from people who were opening that, oh well, we're serving the white whiskey until we have barrel aged product, and then we'll probably work it out of our lineup. Is that kind of accurate for what people were doing and has the sentiment kind of changed in the industry? Yes, I think it depends distillery to distillery. So what, what was very prominent, especially in the early days of the craft distilling industry is what was commonplace, especially if you're a small distillery is you distill a batch of rye, you take half, you put it in the bottle, you take half, you put it in the barrel. Um, so you have product to sell now and you're putting stuff away that you'll have available in a few years that you can you know, sell for more money. Um, and that was the business model of a lot of early on distilleries. And then when they got their age product, they stopped doing white. And that's because it never really got going. White whiskey was really popular, I remember, for one year and then kind of died off after that. Um, and I usually tell new distillers that if you are making a white whiskey, distill it to be a white whiskey. If you tasted some of my, my matchstick or boot jack right off the still, it wouldn't taste good. It's, it's distilled to be changed and altered, chemically altered in the barrel to develop these complex aldehydes and flavor profiles and cogeners that we're looking for. The white whiskey, we distill much cleaner so that it, it does have some of that character, but it's not like that moonshine that, that um, you know, a lot of people are familiar with. Um, so initially we kind of were in the same boat. We were planning, we we're like, we'll do the white whiskey. And then once we have enough rye out, we'll pull this one. But right now the white whiskey is actually our best selling whiskey in the bar and restaurant scene around Maryland, DC, and Delaware, because it is, made to be enjoyed on its own as a white spirit. So we, we, um, we're keeping all, all, all of the white whiskey in stock. Uh, we'll keep making it. Uh, and it's definitely one of, it, it's a really fun spirit and it's, it's easy to drink and it's fun to make into cocktails. And you know, that's, that's what we, we tried to go for in that one. And you guys are also pretty well known for a collection of uh, cordials that you're producing. I don't know if you have any on the bar there, but um, Trisha in the comments was just saying that she loves whiskey. And I was asking whether or not she had anything in particular about a McClintock whiskey she wanted to talk about. And she said, 
no, but I just got the blood orange saffron cordial and it's delicious. Yeah. And she provided us the best segue because the question was, what would you normally tell people to mix it with? And I know yeah. that you have a cocktail on deck that we we're going to show that features that cordial, but can you talk about cordials and what those are and uh, why people should explore them more? Yes. So cordials are another, like, kind of like in the same family as gin in terms of it was a very, very popular uh, spirit category in the 18 and early 1900s um, and kind of died off a little bit uh, in more recent times in that, uh, you know, I, I usually blame like the 80s and 90s where a lot of the cordials are basically grain alcohol and flavoring chemicals and then some dye to make it some neon, you know, blue to neon red color that you can make very sweet cocktails so with. So like earthquake and aftershock and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah, so yeah, same, same category. Um, but cordials, you know, in, in the 1800s were very cool expressions of flavors that you can make into a spirit. So um, we started our cordial program in collaboration with um, Element Shrubs. Uh, who is a local company here who makes uh, all natural uh, uh, cocktail vinegars using fruits, spices, apple cider vinegar, and a little bit of cane sugar. Um, he makes some awesome shrubs, and then we will take his leftovers to make our cordials and then add some additional flavor components to it as well. Um, so it's a waste neutral product. It's a really cool product line for that purpose. Um, but what we wanted to do was kind of get away from what liqueurs have been known for, um, which is that really sweet, really artificial flavor that if you're making a cocktail, you would only put you know, a quarter of an ounce in because any more than that, it's that cloyingly sweet, kind of gross, uh, unpleasant taste. And it seems, you know, we've seen the cocktail culture is definitely moving away from sweet cocktails and more into like savory and complex cocktails. And our cordial line fits right in. So we do um, four seasonal cocktails. They rotate throughout the year. Right now we have our spring seasonal, which is a blood orange saffron cordial. And uh, unlike if you ever read the back of like a, a De Kuiper bottle, you'll see a whole bunch of chemicals on here. This is made from a, a, a neutral spirit made from wheat, rye, and corn. It's made with blood orange slices, saffron, ginger, carrots, apple cider vinegar, and the legal minimum amount of cane sugar uh, to still classify this as a cordial. So ours, with that apple cider vinegar, all of our cordials are much more savory than they are sweet. There's always a spice component and a savory component. The cane sugar helps round it out, but it's not necessarily like what you would normally associate with liqueur. Um, after this, we'll be back into our summer, which is a blueberry rosemary cordial, one of my personal favorites. Uh, then the fall is a cranberry hibiscus. And then the uh, winter is our most popular one, which is the spice pear. It's a chai spice blend um, and fresh uh, Asian pears is uh, really good in any hot cocktail. So it's really good for the winter time. Um, this year, we'll let you in on a little sneak peek that probably this summer we will also be releasing a limited release uh, cordial that is a ginger lime that is really, really good. So we're finishing up the test batches of that now and should have some more information on that sometime this summer. So I'm intrigued when I think about cocktail builds and things like that, that I've seen in the past, you know, you have these traditional liqueurs that you would use. Um, is it easy to use most of your cordials as straight replacements for those? Um, I think it depends on the cordial. So the one we're using today um, is probably the easiest to incorporate into cocktails um, because it has that citrus component you can use it to replace uh, triple sec. It's like a less sweet version of triple sec. You can use it to replace like Campari. It's like a more savory and less bitter version of Campari. Um, pretty much, I mean, there's so many different orange liqueurs out there. Grand Marnier, you can really replace this for any of them um, as a kind of to add 
less of that sweet note and more of just like a little bit of spice, a little bit of depth, a little bit of complexity to a cocktail that sometimes, particularly stuff like, um, we have a lot of bars that use this in orange crushes. So it's something that already has a ton of sweetness, a lot of sugar with orange juice in it. This is just rather than adding triple sec, which is going to add even more sugar and sweetness to it, it just gives it complexity and it, you know, makes, turns a kind of what a lot of bartenders would call a basic cocktail and just put a twist on it and make it something that's unique and kind of cool to, to each person. That's awesome. And I think that's really helpful for people that may come in and taste your cordial and then wonder, hey, how how would I use this? You know, kind of the same boat that Trish is in right now. How, how do I take this delicious product that I got and use this more regularly than maybe just as a sipping um, addition and to my, my all bar? The, all the cordials can be used like more like a traditional cordial. If you can use it as like an aperitif or like as a dessert sipping spirit as well. You can just add some club soda for really light, kind of like low, low sugar, high flavor, like spritz. Um, uh, so it's, they're, they're fun to use. They're relatively easy to use. And, um, uh, you know, they're, they're, uh, you can make some really interesting cocktails. And since I know what cocktail you're going to present this afternoon, and I think you may have mentioned it, uh, and we're about eight minutes away from four o'clock, which I think is like the legally determined happy hour time across the country. Um, do you mind showing everybody what what you suggest people make with uh, some of your spirits right now? Yes. So uh, for the cocktail today, um, we pick probably my... In, in my top three favorite drinks to make for myself. Uh, and one of, my, uh, one of my favorites to order from a bar too, because this is a really simple cocktail that can be made many, many different ways, which is really neat. And it is an equal parts cocktail, which I like because I have been a distiller for a long time, uh, not so much bartender. So I'm a pretty, pretty awful bartender. And this one is easy enough that even I can make it. Um, so it's uh, traditionally uh, the Negroni is a equal part gin, uh, Campari, and sweet vermouth cocktail. Uh, it is the third most popular gin cocktail out there on the market today. And um, I'm really starting to see it a lot more frequently nowadays, which is awesome to see because it's, uh, you know, it has the botanical presence of the gin, it has that bittering component of the Campari, uh, with what we'll be using today. Um, and the vermouth gives it uh, like a light, almost fruit sweetness without adding, you know, a ton of really over the top sweet elements to it. Um, so if, if we're ready, should, should I uh, make one up here? Yeah, the only thing that I'm wishing is that you were wearing that uh, that linen suit that you wore at your inventor's uh, <laughs> gathering because that would be the perfect thing to watch you mix a cocktail in. It'd be good, yeah. If I had my, if it wasn't raining so much, I would have rocked the white linen suit today. But I'll grab uh, an ice cube and then uh, we can make this up. And while Braden grabs that ice cube, I just want to thank everybody for tuning in with us this afternoon. Please remember that Maryland Spirits are open for business. Our distilleries across the state have a multitude of different options for you to be able to support them. Uh, many of them are open for curbside pickup. As Braden said earlier, they're offering delivery, as are many other distilleries throughout the state. And retail options at your favorite local liquor stores are wonderful. I was in a retailer earlier this afternoon but a wonderful end cap full of Maryland spirits, and that's encouraging to see. So uh, please ask your favorite local liquor store to support your uh, local producers or go directly to the source. Hit up your favorite local distillery right now and figure out how you can order their bottles. If you look in the comments of this uh, conversation, there is a link to McClintock Distilling's website and their product lineup, and you can order directly through them. Um, and also check out MarylandSpirits.org for updated retail information from our members. And on that note, uh, I will end it as soon as Braden is done shaking his thing and showing us what's going on with this uh, awesome Negroni. So, Braden, thanks for coming on this afternoon. Show us what you're up to with that great cocktail, and uh, we'll get you out of here. It was my pleasure. For Thank you for having me, and uh, please bear with me. Like I said, I'm a much better distiller than I am a bartender.
Uh, for this one, I have one ounce for your gin. One ounce blood orange saffron. And one ounce sweet vermouth. And shake this up. Strain into a glass. I have our fancy. Uh, Fancy cube ice, but any ice will do for this one. And traditionally, this is garnished with an orange peel, but because we have so much orange already in the blood orange saffron, I like to garnish it with a little bit of lemon, give it a little bit more of that uh, bittering uh, note to it. And you have yourself a Negroni. Cheers. Well, I hope you enjoy that. I'm going to go uh, mix one of those for myself, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your week. Thanks again to everybody who took a few minutes to uh, watch with us this afternoon. It's been a great time. Uh, and again, the only thing that we can ask is that we continue to show support for these great businesses in our communities. And thank you. We will see you all next week at 3 o'clock on Thursday. Tune in and uh, find out what else is going on around Maryland. See you next time.